Banen. Cut to. Exterior. Interior. Restaurant. Bar. Club. Day. Night. Action. Guys, burgers can be amazing, but they also can be demoralizing. Beyond disgusting is what I'm talking about. And there's no one better than to talk about these demoralizing, disgusting burgers than Donna Carey. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Restaurant Fiction. How you doing? My name is Monis Rose, the host of the Restaurant Fiction podcast, where we review fictional bars restaurants, and clubs featured in TV and film. Donna Carey is our guest today. Like many of the guests we have on, Donna has a laundry list of some of the best credits in TV, ranging from The Late Show with David Letterman to Silicon Valley to the new NBC comedy AP Bio. He's here. He's here on the Restaurant Fiction Podcast because he is an aficionado of Krusty Burger, probably one of the most demoralizing Discussing burger places on the planet. You know the one, the one featured in The Simpsons. We are not talking about the one or the ones featured in the Universal Studios Amusement Park. No, this is the world of The Simpsons, all things The Simpsons. Donick, he's had a major hand in two of my favorite Simpsons episodes. The missile the excuse me, the Mr. Sparkle episode in Marge We Trust and 30 Minutes in Tokyo, which both deal with Japan and Japanese culture. We get into both of those episodes, as well as how Donick would rewrite them if they aired in 2017. Pretty much this was an awesome conversation, an incredible one. Donick shares probably one of the funniest restaurant stories I've ever heard. He shares wisdom on staffing a writer's room and what he looks for in hiring new writers versus veteran ones, as well as his very own number of rewrites and his rewriting process. Probably, though, the most important thing Donick mentions that was news to me was his passion project. It's with the charity MUSAC, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and the MUSAC Rock and Roll Carnival. Uh, For those that are unfamiliar with this charity, uh, MUSAC gives kids and teens a voice through music by providing uh, guitars, drums, and support for music teachers all around the globe. One of the biggest fundraisers for MUSAC is the Rock and Roll Carnival, which uh, Donna Carey has a major, major hand in. It's held every October in the Hancock Park area of Los Angeles. Uh, Though the carnival, when this episode airs, the carnival has already passed, and we apologize for that. But we do mention at the end of the episode how you can either donate or be a part of the participate in next year's carnival. Without further ado, please enjoy this incredible conversation with Donna Carey and the review of Krusty Burger. All right, everyone. Today, we are talking to Donick Carey. Uh, we brought him on board because he is an aficionado on Krusty Burger. So before we get Donick's taken things, I'm going to do a little review on Krusty Burger. So Krusty Burger is a staple in Springfield, Oregon, and when we went Before we even had to go, we had to sign a 1,000-page waiver. Why? Uh, It was no concern to us. Pretty much this waiver said that if you ate here, you were probably going to die. I mean, it just was that kind of thing. We went ahead and did it anyway. I was thirsty for my first visit, or our first visit, and I thought the uh, water just magically turned into wine because it just seemed like a cartoony world. No, it was just dirty water. And then I was rushed to the hospital. I came back, and the second time was that I had the actual crusty burger. And the crusty burger was green, and it was purple. I ate it anyway. 
because, you know, when in Rome, I'm just going to do it. Now, that Krusty Burger was free, and I actually loved it. it uh, I, I loved it so much I wanted another one. And I asked to buy another one, and then this pimply-faced teenager said a hundred dollars and I was like well why I mean but I need it so I I ponied up the cash but then suddenly the feds came in and raided the place because all of these crusty burgers with were, were laced with cocaine and other drugs the third time I went to crusty burger I saw a man strangling his son and I thought well let's uh, call child protective services because this is not right and you know, the employees were like, it happens every day, it's entertaining. And, you know, when you're, when you're outside of it, when you, you know, when you're like in that meditative state, you kind of give in. You're like, yeah, it is quite entertaining. So just like, let it be. All right, the fourth time I uh, just asked, I don't know what the question I asked was, but they thought, or all the employees thought I was a narc. So I guess whatever was happening back in the kitchen, you know, where all the mice and the rats and the cockroaches were getting chopped up into the burgers, they all ran out. Finally, the true test of when I dined at Krusty Burger was when I ordered uh, the Krusty Burger 2, the Rib Witch, the Clogger. I had a bite of the Clogger, and it had the consistency and the taste of fake and I only had one bite, and then I had a heart attack. I'm, I'm a fit guy. I'm, I, you know, I work out. There is nothing wrong with me. There are 10 defibrillators on site at the Krusty Burger. They had to pump me back to life. I did not have the chance to sample the others. You know, Krusty Burger, they uh, want to make money as much as possible. Uh, meaning, and that's a good thing. We, we are an uh, entrepreneur. I'm not condemning this in any way. Restaurant Fiction is not condemning this in any way, shape, and form. And what I mean by that is they say the restaurant is kosher. No, it's not. It's open for the high holidays. Uh, they, they serve pig, but they just want to get money. Now, uh, Krusty Burger did receive an F rating. Is that going to stop Krusty Burger from closing? No. Is this bad review going to stop Krusty Burger from closing? No. Is anybody really trying to close Krusty Burger? No. It's just going to be the fun place it is. And if you're willing to sign your life away, go ahead and eat at it. So, Donick, what would you think? Sounds like you had quite an adventure. Yes. Or a, a number of adventures. Uh, you're a brave man to do this. Uh, uh, it was an investment of time and and physical like and and risk of your own health. How are you feeling now? I mean, I'm feeling fine. It was you know, it it took about a year. You know, a year of restoration and doctors and surgeons. <clears throat> But, you know, us at Restaurant Fiction, we're, we're tough. We can tough it out. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we have a job to do, so we're going to do it. Which item did you enjoy the most? I have to say, I mean, it really comes down, I think, to the original Krusty Burger. And this is not the one that was even laced with anything. It just had a funky color. And it's like when in Rome. You know, you're signing, you're literally signing your life away. Like on page one, it literally says, you will die if you eat here. Right. I mean, page two is probably the same thing. Yeah. Like page three is, if you lawyer up, even your lawyers will know you're signing your life away. And the, and the color thing, it wasn't a promotion. It wasn't like Mardi Gras or Christmas or something. It's just, that's what was going on. Yeah. They wouldn't let us see the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Uh, they thought we were narcs, but we saw, you know, insects and rats trickle in, and they were chopping the meat. We can only assume one thing led to another, and some of those critters got into the meat to add to the discoloration. Of course, it could have been a few days, months, or years old as well. Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, uh, would you recommend 
It's hard, it's hard based on your review to recommend it to people, it sounds like. I would still go. Be mindful. Be aware. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're, going to see, you're going to see some things. Like, I mean, not everyone in you know, our society wants to see a, a, a full-grown man strangling his son. But, you know, the people, I think Krusty Burger is its own world. Uh, that when you're inside, you, you embrace it. You embrace mm-hmm. its own little microcosm. Go oh, this macro. Go with the flow. Yes. Right. It's that chill state, which, as any food critic, you really need to be as you explore the world's food. Right. Right. You're entering a world of, of some restaurants, you're entering a, a world of, of flavors and s- scents and, and a satisfied feeling, and this is more of like a horror show of sickness and, and terror. In a, in a way, in a, like a cartoony fun way. Does that, I don't know. Sure. Yeah. You're still standing. Still standing. So. Absolutely. So it, but the review was okay with you? I mean, would you enhance? Was anything really wrong with it? Was anything right? How was customer service? Well, customer service, you know, it's a teenage ran joint. The owner's really never there only to collect uh, money or just appearances. It's like right. a celebrity of sorts in this town. So is he? does he really care about the food quality? Does he really care about that? No. As long as there's, uh, we got the feeling, as long as there's money in his pocket, right. he's going to let it just run itself. Yeah, I guess if the public keeps coming, why why change it if it's working, right? Yes. And if it ain't broken. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. How often is... Uh, Krusty Burger pitched. You know, the, working at The Simpsons is, it's sort of like there is an equivalent for everything you would cross in your day-to-day life. So as you're pitching stories and a story comes up that's like, oh, they should they should be at a fast food joint, the Krusty Burger pops, just pops to mind. The nice thing with Krusty Burger is that, you know, it, it's almost... It's almost too hard to believe what is on TV already. You know, you you there the promotions for you know double stuffed Dorito crusted taco layered waffle sandwiches that actually are on TV almost boggle the mind. Like are almost too much to believe that there's partnerships between Lego and Doritos to make a new kind of cone to put beef in. You know, um, so. The fun challenge of that is is what w- how can we make fun of that? You have to go so far to actually point out that it's ridiculous to 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 do something bigger than what is in reality happening, um, which takes you to some really ridiculous, funny, crazy places. Um, so that's the fun thing. I mean, Krusty Burger is unapologetically exploiting America's health and money and, you know, and gullibility and marketability. And so you go like, this is a company with no morals. It's the funnest thing to pitch for. What, what would they try to jam down people's heart holes this week? You know, absolutely fun to imagine. So two of your episodes of the Simpsons dealt with Japan. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were talking about earlier. If you're writing a third, will you mention the good food in Japan? And if so, what will uh, the characters eat? Mr. Sparkle didn't have food per se in it. I When they went to Japan, they went to America Town, I think it was called, the restaurant, and ordered giant steaks. And, and so that was more parodying what Japanese think Americans like rather than what – Jap- you know, Japanese people are eating. Yeah, now what's interesting is, so that episode was written 15, 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Japanese culture is ancient, but also morphing quickly into the future. Um, so things like sushi are still a constant. But our relationship to sushi and food in Japan has changed a lot. There's been a lot of Japanese takes on Japanese food. You can go to a Japanese itzakaya a pub and get pub Japanese pub food here. You can get high-end types of sushi we've never thought of. You can get it via a French chef who's added his twist to it. You know, like we understand it, it, you know, it's a little different now to say that like Lisa wouldn't have tried sushi and understand it at this point and that there wouldn't be, you know, I mean, and there is a sushi place in Springfield. So they've, they've clearly gone and, and had, you know, had experiences there. So it's a little harder 
if you were writing that episode today, if they went to Tokyo to just do like, oh, we're trying Japanese food and chopsticks. Aren't those weird? I think America as a culture has evolved beyond that. We're all somewhat aware. You can go to almost any supermarket and get sushi at this point. So the types of restaurants in Japan now are different. There's certainly ancient sushi, but there's also like – I was there maybe like six months ago and there's a real craze for Italian food. There's a there's an Ita- pasta on every block and it's like – it's a Japanese take on pasta but it's also very traditionally Italian, homemade pasta. It's d- amazing. I mean everything there is amazing and clean and delicious and trying to be the best. There's also – Every corner has a patisserie, like they're making French bread and croissants and pastries every block, coffee and pastries. Yes. I mean it's it it's is. amazing. It's the it best. Is. But you would have to do something, you know, they'd walk down the street and be like, where the hell are we? And be eating pastries and Japan's so great because they make croissants, you know, like you'd have to do a take on that now rather than just, oh, they have sushi. Um, my 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 memory too of, of sushi there that was so good was like – even in the subway platform, there's like a box, you know, a sushi chef carving up sushi, and you just buy a bento box before you get on the, on the train, and you eat. You're like, this is the best sushi I've ever had. It's fresh, fresh yeah. and delicious, and so like quality, you know. Um, so anyway, what was your question? Is writing a scene in an animated uh, fictional restaurant or bar uh, different than live action? And if so, how? Um, I mean, I, I think that it, it, it is in that it is um, like anything with animation is that anything is possible. Like you're not restricted by what props or wardrobe or the actors can do. Your, you, your imagination is a little more limitless. So where, you know, like you, you mentioned before we started talking, when I was on Parks and Rec, we wrote a scene in a restaurant and we made the grossest salad you could think of that had – different kinds of cheese and gumballs and meat and, you know, like candy and stuff also sprinkled on top. Um, and we could all, we could go pretty far with that and that was a pretty gross salad. But if you animated it suddenly, you could also add, you know, a – whatever, a live ferret is is – you know, molting on it or whatever, yeah. dirty needle, whatever. Yeah. And you could stack it to the roof and you could have people, you know – um, that that it's been injected with a a malted uh, milkshake in the center of the salad that you put straws in and drink at, like you can't make that exactly. You know that that there's a volcano of chocolate overflowing it. You can try, and occasionally you can make props, but like the fact that you can you can kind of go anywhere. I mean, yeah, Homer's ho- heart can literally explode in a scene, and in the next scene he's he's okay again. You know, it's hard to do that with an actor. You know. <laughs> yeah. Anyone can walk in there, so you don't have to make excuses storytelling wise. Usually, why someone shows up, new characters can cross through at any time, so it's a very easy place to go. Like, oh, I met a girl. Oh, I might somebody from that other scene happens to be here. It it covers up some coincidence that you have to create otherwise. Like, if you're always in somebody's living room, it takes a lot more story work to get somebody just to show up. Whereas a bar, anyone could show up at any time. Um, I think it's also. Hanging out at a bar suggests hanging out, which then means you can talk about almost anything. Any kind of story could be talked about there. So it's a very good universal place to talk about whatever's going on in the episode and get other people's perspectives and characters. You always have a bartender, so a lead character essentially can be talking to himself with a bartender just nodding, you know, and and very cheaply you can – have exposition, you know, uh, it's just like, I feel so crappy right now. Give me another drink. And you're like, Oh, we know that character feels crappy done. We don't have to like show some montage of him out being sad or whatever, you know? Uh, so it, it, it's also, um, you know, you build it once and you can do thousands of different kinds of scenes there. You can have parties, you can have birthdays, you can have, that's a two kinds of parties. Sorry. Uh, you can have, Dates, you could have pe- people doing single, you know, e- exposition. So it's very yeah, fights, efficient. So. Yeah, fights, yeah. Like, so when you're creating your own characters, do you ever think what he or, uh, she or, um, he or she is going to eat? You know, oh, are they a beer drinker? Is she a whiskey drinker? Yeah. I mean, I think I think to the I, food matters a lot to me. You know, I, I'm very particular about what I eat and types of things, and I'm very adventurous of, of trying new things. I think 
it's one way to show what kind of person you're creating as a character, that they have specific things that they like to eat or not eat. Um, I think just defining someone as a vegan or a gluten-free or someone who like is like a carnivore or thinks of themselves as like a coffee addict or whatever, like already starts to define them for other people. You start to understand what kind of person that is and uh, it's going to inform scenes when they show up and are like, oh, I see you got a coffee maker. Mind if I get a cup of coffee? You know, like that they're somebody who loves coffee is going to be part of, you know, um, who they are in series. What's a real restaurant funny experience that you've had that you've either put into um, The Simpsons or, you know, one of your other shows? Let's see, a funny restaurant experience. Um, I mean, the, the funniest thing that I've never quite gotten into a show but is like, well, at some point, was was I was at a dinner with a buddy of mine and there was a candle on the table that was and, – and it was it was a quiet, romantic restaurant. Uh, we were with our, I think, girlfriends at the time, though one of us might have been married already. I'm not sure. But it was a quiet dinner with our significant others. And my buddy had been producing a magic special with David Blaine. And he was like, oh, I'm, Blaine taught me this trick. So this is an amazing trick. And it was like, okay, what's the trick? He's like, I can drink, I can drink this candle. And we're like, what? Come on, dude. No, you can't drink the candle. He's like, I can drink the candle. Watch this. And he like very, he kind of did some magic-y like preparing stuff, like waved his hands. And then he picked up the candle and he said, here, here we go. And he shot back the hot wax in the candle and immediately went, ah, ah, and started gagging and choking. He knocked the table over uh, and was spitting hot wax as it solidified in his throat and uh, was gagging, 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 finally spit up a ball of wax, sc- like screaming in terror, choking. Um, he had executed the trick wrong, so he had <laughs> just poured hot wax into his throat and burned the inside of his mouth and then panicked in this very quiet romantic restaurant. So every, you know, I, his, his wife or girlfriend was horrified, but quickly in tears laughing. I mean, it was incredible, incredible. You couldn't time, time it better of just like, here's what I'm going to do. And the exact opposite happened. It was great. So, yeah, I mean, two questions come from that. This is yeah. fantastic. What's going through? Are you, are you just laughing or no? Are you... Call, like call the ambulance or are you like, hey, this is hilarious? Surprise and then hilarity were the two Immediately overriding. was like safe, not going to die? Well, I mean there was a little bit of like anybody who's going to do a magic trick and, is, is, uh, and fails, there's an element of comedy to that no matter what it is. Um, you know, magic, being a magician is a self-imposed, uh, you're putting yourself in a hole a little bit already. I love magic. I'm on board, but it's not something you have to do. So he's doing something he did not have to do. It's hard to feel terrible for him. He, he had brought it all on himself. Did your friend ever try to perfect this trick or, or at least realize what he did wrong, you know? He, uh... He is still to this day, whenever I bring it up, a little annoyed that he's like, yeah, you, you just didn't get it. I just, I was supposed to have ice cubes and they melted. Like he's still a little ashamed and annoyed and doesn't want to talk about it. <laughs> and it's probably the most amazing thing I've ever seen him do. And he's done a lot of amazing things. So, someday that's got to be in a show of some kind. It's so great. What elements do you look for when staffing a writer's room? <laughs> Staffing writers from uh, there's different metaphors, but like if you're like into fantasy football, or if you've ever had a rock band, or if you've been on a little league baseball team, you're looking for a team of people who complement each other, that might each have different roles, that there's going to be some crossover, that you hope that everyone has different strengths. You you you're, it's all about balance. You know you you you're you're creating a a team that is going to be able to do this this particular production over a long period. You're not going to just be sitting with them for a week. You're going to be with this team for, 
potentially seven years, you know, like when, when these shows get picked up, you're like, wow, this could run for seven years. This could run for 10 years, whatever. The Simpsons has been on for 25 years. So like a lot of those people have been sitting in the room together for 20 years. You know, you're going to, you're going to learn what people are good at. But I think one thing I I've learned is that not everybody's good at everything, but what you hope is that a, they're willing to learn B, they're not a bummer if they're if they're so good at something that they're going to lord it over everyone else, or that they're not good at something and are going to just keep pitching on that even though they're not good at it. But that their strengths in other areas way more than make up for that. It's like if you had if you um, drafted a running back and expected him to make all the tackles on defense, you're like, well, no, he's good at being a running back, uh, or he's a bass player, he's not a drummer, so like. He can sit in on drums. He's okay at that, but that's not his or her strength. It's all about balance. You're building a team. You're finding people who can do different things and and eventually help you get your vision made. Hopefully, they're just nice, normal, funny people who also are on board to make the thing. How often do you take in new writers versus veteran writers? Starting at the Letterman show was really interesting for me because it was all about grooming that next set of writers, like people who could, would get the show, were good at the show. And then, you know, if you invested time in them and let them figure out what had been done, what had not been done, make some mistakes, like basically go through that training wheels phase, then they were going to be people you could really count on and, and, uh, help you through next year's hard, hard episodes, you know, that you're, you're definitely investing in, you always want to be investing in young writers or new voices that hopefully are – you're putting a little time in on them so – and that's going to come back and pay pay off. Once, once they get it, they're also bringing their voice to the show and expanding the range and scope of what that show can cover and, and now they kind of owe you. But you also want a couple pe- – you know, it's, it's often comes down to budget is you can't just hire all writers who have big, established, expensive quotes – so just budgets don't do that. So you can hire two and then you have two writers on your staff. And then we, week one starts and one of them's on set and one's out writing a script and now you're alone in the writer's room going like, uh, what do I do now? Um, you still need a bass player. You still need a keyboardist. Right. You still need some backup singers. Yeah. Even on a even on a week where your lead guitar is on the set, you need someone to play guitar. You know, so so maybe it's you're not doing the slash sl- solos this week, but you're doing you, you definitely want that rhythm to keep going. Maybe this metaphor's burned itself out, but, um, but yeah, I think it's a, it's about balance. You're trying to find maybe a few veterans and a few a few young voices, and then some middle ground people, and you know, have enough numbers to be able to to always have bodies on hand to get get through the next script. How many rewrites do you do on a screenplay? The hardest part of writing a spec script is you can do you could write that forever. Uh, when you're in production on something, you have a date that is. There's a table read. You have a date that is recorded. You know that that you're on set with actors and cameras are rolling. So, you know, you you do typically you'll do uh, at least with what we're doing right now is like th- there'll be a writer's draft, but you have to back up from there. Is that you've done a story document with the writer, you've done an outline. We've all weighed in on that. That that outline has been fleshed out. Then there's a writer's draft of the script that all the writers weigh in on, or at least the showrunner weighs in on. That goes to the studio. They'll do notes. Then you'll do notes on that draft. Then it goes to the network. The network gives notes, and you do a, notes on that draft. Then that goes to a table read. After the table read, everyone gives notes again, and you do a draft of that. And then that that you know, like even then, sometimes an actor will have a note, or the casting doesn't come through the way you want it, and you might have to do another tweak or a draft before you record it. And sometimes, even on set, you'll be rewriting a scene or adding a few jokes because you you, you see it on its feet, and you go like, "Oh, that didn't quite work the way we wanted." Quick answer is like four or five drafts, you know, but it could be as many as eight drafts. <laughs> One of your passion projects is uh, the Rock and Roll Carnival. Uh, yep. You know, uh, how is that going this year? Because it's about to, uh, this episode will air after uh, the Rock and Roll has already happened, but how is the process and what do you think of the, um, you know, of the growth of what you've started? Yeah, so so the charity is Muzak, Muzak, M-U-S-A-C-K dot org. Um, we had a huge year this year as far as expanding the, what the charity does, which um, we, we expanded to um, 
uh, tribal lands in Alaska to a school up up, up there in the middle of, of I mean I want to say nowhere but it is somewhere um, but you literally know roads in and out it's a snowbound place and the music school there that feeds I think it was 17 might have been 78 it's one or the other um, native villages in the area so the kids come in and go to boarding school there from um, from native Alaskan villages and and we help set up a guitar you know bring guitars there and their um work with a music teacher and their music program we spread to native america here all around um on the navajo reservation uh acoma reservation apache a school on apache land so a, a whole bunch of different native american programs starting our program in appalachia is growing uh, we have fiddle labs and, and guitar labs there. We started a program in, in Cuba that was so fun where we can't actually send – you can't just mail guitars there. So we set up a thing called Muzak Missionaries where we, we encouraged our supporters to take a trip to Cuba. And we give them a, a list of restaurants and, and bars and things that we thought were cool to do there. But the only thing was they'd have to bring guitars and take them to this music school that we're, we we adopted and are, have been helping. So, yeah, so the carnival, I mean, the part of the funnest part of all this is, like, we get to do this rock and roll carnival, which we haven't done yet, but we'll have done when this airs. We had an amazing lineup this year, Billy Bragg and the English Beat and Wayne Kramer from MC5 is doing a set. And um, Shepard Ferry's there and Yo Gabba Gabba's DJ Lance Rock. The lead uh, singer of Rancid. Right. Tim Armstrong will, will be back. We have a, a fallen tree with a that he climbs up in every year now and does a set from the top of the the, the uh, branches. Uh, so Tim Armstrong will be back doing that. Yeah, I mean we're just we're going to do Sergeant Pepper's 50th anniversary, or we just did, and uh, and Ziggy Stardust 45th anniversary. So plus a Star Wars celebration. So lots of lots of craziness. Plus food trucks, more food and and fun. So that's awesome. What are you ordering at Krusty Burger? I would have to I would go for the clogger I think if you're going down just go down go just go all in and 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 go out go out go out fighting fighting for a breath fighting for your life fighting for for your blood to keep flowing Excellent Sorry, this was fun This was fun Did you enjoy yourself? Yeah, absolutely. All right, good. Thank you. Absolutely. Donic. That was awesome. I've learned pretty much never to do a David Blaine impression. Also, what's interesting is when either I'm writing an animated show or anybody wants to write an animated show, just go big. You know, Donic does it, especially when you're writing a restaurant scene or a bar scene. Go big. I mean, do not go home. Just keep it in the restaurant, write in the restaurant, write in the bar, and go as big as possible. Oh, and the Musac Carnival, the Musac Musac. I'm going to uh, get hopefully fan mailed how to pronounce that right. Uh, but the Rock and Roll Carnival, which I attended, it was fucking awesome. All the bands and singers that Donick described were there, and I highly, highly recommend uh, people to get the chance to go next year. Uh, to donate and support, or just read up on the carnival and the amazing things that Musac does, go to uh, musac.org. That's M U S A C K dot O R G. And you can check out Donick's writing on any of the shows he's had a hand in. Just go to his IMDb page for that. As well as be on the lookout for the new NBC comedy AP bio. I'm your host, Monis Rose. And you can go and read more restaurant reviews at restaurantfiction.com. And as always, keep it real, keep it fresh, and keep it on the flip side. Cut to... Exterior. Interior. Restaurant. Bar. Club. Day. Night.